So today I want to start off this, kick off this whole series on the proving ground. And I want to talk about the concept of the proving ground and the concept of God testing our heart, testing our life, and how much the Bible talks about that. Uh, God provides tests for us. Uh, life provides tests for us. But uh, God has intention in those tests, whereas without the Lord um, guiding our life, uh, we could just go through tough stuff all the time. But uh, the proving ground, the tests that God provides for us, uh, they, they help us grow as people. They reveal our heart to us, uh, let us know what's really in there. Uh, they reveal to us things that we know, also reveals to us things that we don't know, reveals to us things that we have uh, and, and proves what's in there, but also proves what sometimes we don't have. And all of these tests or these proving grounds are provided to prepare us to live out our full potential in life. There's probably a lot of things or at least a few things that would hinder uh, us from realizing our full potential. Uh, there, if, until, until your thinking has been challenged, sometimes you don't realize how small your thinking can be. You know, it depends on the, the family situation you grew up in, uh, the environment around you. Uh, if your thinking is small, if your thinking is limited, it's going gonna, it's gonna to hold you back from realizing your full potential. Uh, some of us have experienced family dysfunctions. Uh, there are family curses that, uh, that are in our family. So it might be addiction, it might be poverty, it might be abuse. Uh, there's all kinds of things that could be utilized by the enemy to keep us from realizing our full potential. And the test help us see those things. The proving ground helps us see what's there so we could go. And I, I thought Pastor Jeremiah did a great job last week talking about family curses that need to stop with us, right? You know, you may have had a bad experience with, in a relationship. You may have had a bad experience in church. Uh, you may have had a bad experience in, uh, in starting a business or something. And it, and it can hinder your potential. All of us have heart issues or emotional issues that could hold us back. Uh, we have head issues, you know, our own thinking. Really, your best friend is you and your worst enemy is you, right? Uh, some of us have personality issues. Go on, I'm just... I know there's some people that are going to be in second service that need to hear that, but that, that are holding us back. You have to be able to pass second grade tests in order to go to third grade. It's not fair to you. It's not fair to the people around you. Uh, you have to pass a driver's test to let you out on the road. Aren't you glad that there are driver's tests that, uh, that test people <laughs> before we let them out on the road? Now when I see a 15-year-old or a 16-year-old starting to drive a car, I'm thinking babies shouldn't be driving cars. It's just, that's a lot of equipment to push around. You know, you, want, you, wanna, you have eye tests to see whether you need help to see or not. Uh, we take blood tests that prove health or prove there's an issue. What I'm saying is testing is always a part of life. Testing is always a part of advancing in life. Uh, you know, you have to learn addition and subtraction. You get tested on that. That precedes learning algebra and geometry. 
By the way, I loved algebra in school. I hated geometry. Just thank God I don't have to use that very often, <laughs> along with many things I learned in school. Every season has a reason. It has, it has a, a lesson in it. It has a proving ground involved in it. And I know some people think this way. These problems that are in my way are holding me back. If I didn't have these problems, I would, I would be moving forward. But it's not, it's not the problem that holds us back. It's our inability to solve the problem. The ability to solve the problem, the ability to think higher, to believe higher, to, to get over the issues that are in our own heart, um, to, get, uh, to get past the things that maybe got handed down uh, from our family or from even from religious backgrounds sometimes can keep us. It's not the problem. It's the fact that we don't know how to solve it. The, the problem that you're facing is the test. It's the test that reveals. We have to know uh, who we are. We, we have to know what's in us. Uh, we have to know what's not in us. And as, as much as we all like to go around the obstacles and the problems of life, the truth is God will set up second grade tests over and over and over again until we learn the lesson that can graduate us from second grade. Anybody following me? What I'm saying? The, the problem is the path. And I just want to encourage you in this to, to know that God wants to help us. God wants to teach us. God wants to equip us. God wants to lift us in life. And there's something about going through the problems and learning about yourself, what you have, what you don't have. You learn something about God, how faithful he is to his promise. You learn something about where your friendships really lie or not. And as you go through the test of life, as you go through the proving ground of life, you can, you can learn lessons about the faithfulness of God. I know, I know for me, having seen the faithfulness of God so many times in the past puts me in a position now to go, God, I don't know how you're going to help me with this or how you're going to fix this or how this is going to work out, but I know that I've had so many experiences of you showing me that you are faithful to your promise, that you're going to show your faithfulness one more time. But you don't learn that if, if we're always trying to skip the test, skip the problem, you know, go, go around it. We learn about how faithful God is to his promise. You learn about yourself, what your capabilities really are. You learn about how to interact with other people. So just a, a few verses to let us see how much the Bible talks about this concept of testing. Deuteronomy verse, uh, chapter 8, verse 2 says, You shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years in order to humble you, putting you to the test. Everybody say the test. He's putting you to the test in these 40 years of manna falling from the sky, and that's how they ate, uh, and to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So the Bible says that God puts us to the test so that we know what's in our heart. Deuteronomy 8, 16 says, In the wilderness it was he who fed you manna, which your fathers did not know, in order to humble you and in order to put you to the test to do good for you in the end. And you got to remember that. The tests that we go through are 
intended to be good for us in the end, right? Te the test that God, this is the beautiful thing about understanding what you walk through as you walk with God is that the tests are never intended to destroy you. The tests are intended to develop you. God has an agenda. The problem that you're facing right now, God has an agenda to teach us something, to reveal himself, to reveal us to ourselves. God has an agenda in the test, but I do want to remind you that the devil also has an agenda. And we've talked about this idea, you know, you can get, get better or you can get bitter. You know, sometimes people will ask me, well, should, should I submit to God or should I resist the devil? And my answer is always yes. <laughs> you, you got to do both. You are not going through your test alone. God is testing you, but God is with you. He, he has purpose in mind in your test. He has purpose in mind for your life. Everybody say this. This is only a test. There you go. So whatever you're facing, you might be thinking, oh, this is the big one, Elizabeth. Some of you now have no idea what I'm talking about, but some of you do. This is the big one, Elizabeth. Here I come. No, this is only a test. You got to remind yourself, your life is in the hands, the loving hands of an amazing God. He will see you through. Remember when uh, the Lord was helping Gideon uh, trim the army down, which it never seems like the right thing, but God had a, uh, there started out with 30,000. God wanted to get it down to 300. Feels like church sometimes. Judges 7 verse 4, the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Bring them down to the water and I will test them for you there. It will be that he of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, he'll go with you. But everyone of whom I say to you, this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. Some people are on the journey for a season. Some people are on the journey for a long time. Praise God for both of them, really. But this is an interesting test that God puts in front of Gideon's army because what he's telling them is this, when, when we come to the water, these guys are gonna get down and drink water. The guys that go down and just put their head down all the way and, and do the water, they are not the ones that are gonna go forward with you because those are people that are more interested in their own refreshment than they are with staying alert in life. But he said, there's going to be a group and they're going to have their head up and they're going to be alert and they're going to understand that refreshment is for refreshing. Refreshment is not what your whole life is supposed to be about. Somebody's going, darn, why did I come to this service? But the truth is, you've got to have a sense of purpose in life that makes you realize refreshment is important but you gotta keep your head up. You gotta stay alert. You gotta keep looking at what's going on. You don't wanna just bury your head in the refreshment of life. That's the test that God was putting Gideon's army through. This is Second uh, Chronicles 32. There's a king named Hezekiah, and uh, the Bible says about him, even in the matter of the messengers of the rulers of Babylon who were sent to him to inquire about the wonder that had happened in the land, God left Hezekiah 
alone to test him so that he might know everything that was in his heart. Sometimes it feels like God is absent, but the truth is he's stepping back just for a second. He's still with you. He's still for you. But the test is so that he might know everything that's in his heart. Sometimes you don't actually know what's in your heart until you run into something. You don't, you don't know if there's anger issues in there until you run into something. You know, if you have a glass of orange juice and you knock it over, what comes out is orange juice. And if you have a glass of water and you knock it over, what comes out is water, coffee. Whatever is in is what comes out. And sometimes we don't realize what's really going on till somebody knocks our glass of orange juice over and we, and we can see what's going on. Sometimes it feels like God is backing off, but the truth is he's just letting you know, hey, that's stale coffee. You need, get, you need to get something fresh going on inside of you. Psalm 7 verse 9 says, please let the evil of the wicked come to an end. Somebody say amen. But establish the righteous, for the righteous God puts hearts and minds to the test. Jeremiah 17, 10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind to give to each person according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. Wow. So God tests our minds. He not only tests our hearts, he tests our minds, our thinking. Our thinking needs to align with his thinking. And he said, I just want everybody to know that no, whatever you're thinking, eventually the result of your deeds are going to manifest. Uh, I'm a big fan of teaching and practicing and understanding the grace of God, but can I just tell you that you are free to choose to do whatever you want to do, but we're not free to choose the consequences of what we've done. And that's where the test comes in. So today, I want to start us off. We're going to, there's nine different proving grounds. And I want to talk about the test of small things. The test of small things. Number one, the way we handle small things reveals how we will handle big things. So here's Jesus, Matthew 25. He's giving five talents to one guy, two talents to another guy, one talent to another guy. Verse 23, he comes back to the one has, who's been faithful. Two of them were faithful with what were they were given, and their faithfulness was increased, and one was afraid and buried. But his master said to him, Matthew 25, 23, well done, good and faithful slave, you were faithful with a few things. So now I'm going to put you in charge of many things. Enter the joy of your master. If you're faithful in small, you're more than likely to be faithful in big. If you're unfaithful in small, you're more than likely to be unfaithful in big. The way we are handling our present day, our, our life, our problems, our opportunities, our disappointments, our success, is usually a good indicator of how we're going to handle future life and problems, and opportunities, and disappointments, and success. Luke 16, verse 10, says this, He who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. This is Jesus talking. He who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. Therefore, 
If you've not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, who will entrust the true riches to you? That's an interesting idea to me. How we handle our finances is a big indicator. Can God give us the actual true riches? And if you've not been faithful, verse 12, in the use of that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? Three areas of, of testing in smaller things that Jesus gives us here is one, that we be faithful in small things. That the way we handle a small thing is indicative of how we're more than likely to handle a big thing. And then he says, if you're faithful in your finances, if God can get it through you, God will get it to you. But if God can't get it through you, he's going to find somebody else he can get it through. But I think this is a fascinating idea to understand that our, fi our finances are an indicator. What we choose to spend our money on is an indicator of what we really love in life. And so the way that we, if we, if we support the advancement of the kingdom of God, God says, I can, I can get tr the true riches, the riches of revelation, the, the riches of spiritual authority, the riches of intimacy with God, uh, the riches of relationships of people who are warriors for the kingdom of God. You get those, but it shows up through the utilization of our finances. And then he says, if you're faithful in that which belongs to another, because ultimately we have to realize part of our test in life is can we support somebody else's thing? Because we have to be able to understand that everything ultimately is a stewardship from God. And if we could support somebody else's thing, in other words, if you can't be supportive of your boss where you work, it's going to be difficult for you to have your own company. Hello. You know, if, if I've, I mean, I've seen people many times through the years not be able to support the vision of the house and then try to go start something on their own, and they flounder and they, they struggle because they haven't learned. Eventually, we got to realize none of it is our thing. All of it, leadership is a stewardship from God. And once you begin to realize that, so I know this idea, the way you do anything is the way you do everything. The way you do small things is the way you do big things. Here's, here's, here's my discovery. People who are late are almost always late. People who are neat are almost always neat. I could go look in your car, see what it looks like, and pretty much get an idea of what the rest of your life looks like. Somebody said, oh, that's not fair. I know, it's just true. <laughs> Dependable people are who are dependable in small things are most likely going to be dependable in big things. People who complain are always finding something to complain about. Amen. People who are happy are always finding reasons to be happy because the way you do anything is the way you do everything. Second idea I want to talk about in the test of small things is we got to recognize that small seeds create big trees. Big, big trees come from small seeds. We would like to have a fully grown tree delivered to the house. Matthew 13, verse 31, Jesus taught this idea quite a bit. He said, he presented another parable to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like 
a mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field. This seed is smaller than all the other seeds, but when it's full grown, it becomes larger. Smaller becomes larger. Then the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. In the kingdom of God, God starts with small to create big. The, the small seed of today, the small thing of today, the small opportunity of today, the small problem of today, all of that creates the big tree of tomorrow. And this works for good and it works for bad. How I many you know small things can create big problems? I remember... Uh, a few years ago, we had a, an air conditioning line that was running through the ceiling in our basement in my little workout room that I use, so shush. And all of a sudden, uh, it water, this big water thing was developing in the ceiling, kind of found out tiny little pinhole-sized hole in that, in that air conditioning line was creating this huge problem. Last Sunday, last Sunday, I'm getting ready for church. I'm praying. I'm getting myself ready to come to church. All of a sudden, I hear this. I'm in my kitchen, and I hear this poof. And I'm like, what is that? And you guys know, I mean, if you need a handyman, Call John Banks, but that's what I did. I, I just hear this, and I'm going, what is going on? But finally, I track the sound down, I open a cabinet door, and water is just gushing out of this pipe. And I'm trying to, first I close the door like an instant. There you go. I just stop it right there. Stop it. It's just a little bitty hose. Water is gushing out. I'm, I'm, I can't figure out how to turn the thing off. So I'm pitch the hose. I get the phone. I'm calling Suzette. She's upstairs. Honey, bring some towels down. This is a mess. Then I called John Banks. And I said, John, you got to come over right now. So I'm standing there holding this pinched plastic hose. Small things can create big problems. When, when you do small things well, big things can accumulate. When, when we don't do small things well, big things can accumulate. So we're told an apple a day will keep the doctor away. Well, we could do that, but we don't. And here's what most of us do. We decide... All right, I'm going to catch up. I'm going to eat seven apples. I mean, you know, that may, that may send you to the doctor, right? Just a few minutes of exercise on a regular basis will actually take you somewhere. We're thinking we need marathon sessions, but we don't really. A few minutes of exercise skipped, one week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, that's also going to take you somewhere. If you just, if you read your Bible every day in small doses, it's going to take you somewhere. If you have a prayer time, even in small doses every day, it'll take you somewhere. But watch this. Don't read your Bible every day. And the days turn into weeks. They turn into months. They turn into years. And we wonder, why don't I feel the nearness of God. Why don't I feel faith? Why, why, why am I struggling so much with this? Right? Miss church once, it's easy to miss the next time. You just get disconnected. Miss church through an entire pandemic <laughs> and you've developed all new habit patterns and now it's hard to get back in church. Little things can create big things. And I know 
You know, I know coming to church, being part of church isn't exactly everything, but I'll tell you what, I'll promise you this, if you'd show up every Sunday that you possibly can and get fed the word of God and push reset on worshiping God, no matter what you've been through, you start growing, you start getting connected, you start becoming a part of the family, you start becoming a part of the army, you're gonna find that just show up every week kind of thing gonna grow you into something pretty powerful. God, you know, God's way is to start small. He tests us with the small things so that we could grow into the big things. And then the last idea that I want to talk about today is this. Don't despise the small seed of today. Don't despise the small opportunity of today. Don't despise the small forward steps of today. Zechariah 4.10, don't despise the day of small beginnings. Handle the small thing in your, in your life well today, it's going to grow. And you can apply this to any area of your life. If you decide, you know what, I need, I need to get a little more healthy, small steps can take you far. You can decide, you know what, I'm tired of living broke. I'm going to start saving a little bit of money. I don't have a lot of money, but I could save something. I can invest something. You could apply just this idea to learning a new skill. You know, this, uh, this month, we celebrate the fact that our church is 33 years old. Uh, we started, actually, the last Sunday in September of 1989, and the reality is our church started as this small little seed. It was a dream that Suzette and I had. And Suzette and Tori, who was at 15 months old at the time, we packed it all into a U-Haul and we moved to Asheville, North Carolina. Didn't know a soul here. Started with three people. No money, no team, no band, just a dream, just an idea, just how do we handle this small thing well? And the reality is from the way we handled that seed, and then the next thing that now looks small, but didn't seem small at the time. Every new season was built upon faithfulness in the previous season. So, so here the Lord's testing our hearts, testing our minds, testing our faith, testing us, and we've been able to stay faithful through all the building projects that our church has gone through over 33 years. I remember when we were first meeting in, in the little hotel, we were paying $1,000 uh, a, a month to meet in that little hotel conference room. We outgrew it had to find a new space, had to look around. Now I'm paying $1,000 a week. At the time, it seemed big. I would love for our mortgage payment now to be $1,000 a week. That would be awesome. But the truth is, we took one step and were faith, was faithful with it and took another step and were faithful with it. And all through the journey, I let me tell you, I know lots of people, they could preach the paint off the walls, but they can't pass the test of leadership that takes them from one season to the next. That you can be faithful to God even though you face betrayals from people. You can be faithful to God even though we've gone through staff infections. <laughs> Hello? You can be, we can be faithful to God. It's amazed me the number of people that the pandemic knocked out of church. Not just our church, churches all across the world. 
people that have been knocked out because they couldn't be faithful in that season. Now they're out of the race now. Hey, listen, would you, praise God, would just be battling with cancer in this last season. And I'm still kind of half limping on that one. But, uh, but I just, what I just want to say to you is this. Every season has a reason. Don't despise the seed of that dream that's in your heart. Don't despise the seed of what feels like a small opportunity. Don't, e don't despise even the battles of life. God is with you. You are in a grace-protected bubble of the hand of God. The tree of tomorrow just looks like a seed in your hand today. And I've talked about this idea before, but I think it applies to what we're talking about today. People confuse responsibility and authority. People are looking for an opportunity. But the truth is, it's being responsible with the small thing in your hand today that opens the door of opportunity tomorrow. I'm just waiting for my big opportunity. No, God's looking to see what are you doing with your small responsibility. When we're responsible with the seed with the small thing that's in our hand today, it leads to opportunity for tomorrow. Big always starts with small. One last scripture, then we're gonna pray. Matthew 17, verse 20. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible to you. Man, that's a good verse. Wow. You might not feel like your faith is that great. You might not feel like your strength is that great. But here's what the Bible says. Faith the size of a mustard seed. Inner strength the size of a it, It's not big. Just use what you have. Small moves mountains. Small acts of faithfulness, small choices of integrity when nobody sees, small acts of kindness, small in, in diligence will take you to some amazing place. Hey, I want you to bow your heads if you would please and close your eyes. Fathers, we come to you today. We are grateful that you are watching over us. Your heart is to do us good in the end. And I'm praying for every person that's facing a test, that's facing a trial, that's facing a problem, that's facing a proving ground. Right now, Lord, I pray that faith arises. I pray that hope arises. God, I pray, I pray that lessons get learned. I pray that you will show yourself one more time to be faithful to your promises. With your head bowed, your eyes closed, I just wanna take this moment. You know, you might not feel like you're really in a great place in your relationship with the Lord. Maybe you don't feel that, that comfort, that strength, that, that assuredness that your life is in the hands of God. Maybe you've never surrendered to Jesus before. I'd love to pray with you today. Maybe you used to be close to God, but you're not there today. Maybe you, you just don't know, but you want to know. Your life is in the hands of God. Nobody's looking around. We're just taking a minute to pray. But if you say, Pastor, I, I, I want to move closer to God. I want to open my heart to Jesus. I, I want God in my life. I want my life in his hands. Would you pray with me? If that's you, would you just lift your hand real high and say, that's me. Would you pray with me? God bless you. Come on, anybody else? Just want to say, God bless you. Anybody else just want to say yes? Just the small step, the small opening, the small move could turn into something big. Anybody else? Thank you so much. 
Thank you. You can put your hands down now. Let's pray this prayer together. Everybody say this with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I open my life to your love, to your Lordship. I need you. I want you in my life as my Lord. I know I've sinned. I have messed up. But I come to the cross where you have paid the price for my forgiveness. Today is a fresh start. It's a new beginning as I surrender to you. Help me become the person you created me to be. Amen. Come on, let's thank the Lord. Amen. Hey, let's all stand together. On the count of three, we're going to be dismissed. Head on out to Rock Group table. Get registered in a group. Buy a book. Let's just do this together. Ready? On the count of three. One, two, three. Hallelujah. God bless you guys.